Good evening and a very warm welcome to one and all of you. Thank you for joining us in the webinar today. Today, as we all know, we have gathered here in this webinar to discuss on the latest updates for our corporate tax based on the public consultation document issued by the Ministry of Finance. Introducing myself, I am Reshma Raju from the tax department. So moving forward, views expressed in this event are independent views of our presenters based on the information of from the public consultation document published by the Ministry of Finance and the experience of our presenters on an international taxation. Talking about our firm, HLB Hampt, established in 1999 with presence over um, with seven offices UA and in the seventh UA ranking, we have experienced uh, professionals delivering services for more than 3000 clients and a member of uh, HLB International which is again a large network of professional accounting firm with a global ranking of 11th and also something about uh, the International Tax Committee, which uh, has a partner, uh, Mr. Jay Krishnan, who is also a partner of HLB Hamd as a member, along with David Springsteen and Patrick, uh, who is also part of the International HLB Tax Committee. And Let's let's take a look at the presenter's profile for the webinar today. First, we have Mr. Antonio, who is the managing partner of Antonio Gallup from Qatar. He is an experienced person from the transfer pricing with almost more than 16 years of experience. And out next, we have our presenter, who is Mr. Jay Krishnan, partner of tax and compliance of HLB Hampt. Uh, with more than 25 years of experience over tax audit, and he is a very uh, expert of his field. Moving on, we have in our panel Mr. Sumesh Krishna, who is the partner audit and assurance of HLB Hamt, again an expert of his field in account and audit across diverse industries. Followed by in our presenter today, we have Mr. Nitin N.K., partner audit and assurance HLB Hamt, who is also having a wide variety of experience for more than 15 years in various fields across banking, real estate, construction, and many others. Following our fifth person of in our presenting panel today is Mr. Girish Nair, manager and uh, the head of our tax department, who is also having a high uh, many years of experience in Middle East. Moving on. Uh, something about this session before we make a move is that this is based on the public consultation document that is issued by the Ministry of Finance. So they have issued this document uh, to seek the views from all the interested parties on its main features and implementation. So the Ministry welcomes this till uh, by 19th May 2022. So this session that is especially designed based on this document so we give out a very strong disclaimer that this should not be used to make any individual or business decisions as it does not represent the final legislation. So moving forward to our uh, uh, presentation of the day and I hand it over to Mr. Jay Krishnan to start it. Thank you, Reshma. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, thank you all the attendees. And uh, Good afternoon to everyone. I will be mostly focusing on on you know taxable persons, which includes who are subject to taxes, who are not subject to taxes, exempt income, and you know certain specific income which is either exempt or taxable. So I would be focusing more on on those topics. My co-panelists will be discussing the other segments. I will start with the 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 paragraph which Reshma was using earlier, like on, on public consultation document, which is published by the ministry very recently, which you know tomorrow is the, the official deadline for submitting the view or the opinions on that. And there is a link which is also shared. So if anybody has any any, any view on suggestions on, on this particular topic, you know, either you can consult us or you can directly join the link and submit the suggestions. Now I will start with you know, natural person. Natural person is a simple terminology which mostly we are all aware. Yeah. So the 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 public clarification focus on you know what are the taxable uh, you know elements involved for natural persons. So we have you know bifurcated those into two segments. One is commercial and business activity in the UAE and requires a commercial license or equivalent permit. Any natural person who conducts any commercial or business activity in UAE 
in, or he is supposed to carry out any such business activity through a commercial license or an equivalent permit would be subject to corporate taxes. Simple. And an individual or a natural person who engaged in, in, in any employment and earned the income out of employment or any other personal income, say dividend, yeah, dividend rental received from UAE real estate property, investment income, etc. Those would be out of scope for the natural persons. So in simple, an individual who is supposed to conduct an activity through a, a valid commercial license in UAE would be subject to corporate taxes, you know, regardless of whether he's registered for a company or not. Whereas the other personal incomes would be uh, exempt. And on, on this particular segment, you know, there are a few points to be considered, you know, considered in the sense this is subject to a debate or discussion at a later stage. Once the regulations are announced by the ministry, we can answer these queries. But as of now, taxability of management fee or professional fee earned by a shareholder or a director or a manager who are not under the employment contract is a, is a, is a question mark. Is it subject to taxes in the hands of the, the individual or is it going to be non-deductible expenses with the company is a question mark as of now. And taxability of certain professional or freelancer services provided by a natural person is also not clarified in the public clarification. And uh, coming to legal person, legal person we know, you know, like a, a, a company registered in, in UAE. Yeah, that is the, the fundamentally we all know about what is legal person. So legal persons are normally taxable persons. All legal persons would be uh, taxed for the corporate tax purpose, except few specific, you know, exemption given uh, at a later slides. So UAE company and other legal persons incorporated in, in UAE would be counted as a taxable person through a legal structure. So that is subject to corporate taxes. This includes a foreign company having a permanent establishment in the UAE. You know, company not registered in UAE, but foreign company with a PE in UAE would also be considered as a legal person. And legal person incorporated in forest, foreign jurisdiction that effectively controlled and managed in UAE. That is also a tricky terminology. Effectively controlled and managed in UAE, the company incorporated overseas would also be counted as a legal person for this purpose. And taxability of unincorporated partnership, uh, it's specifically mentioned that this is taxed in the hands of the partners or members, not on the unincorporated partnership. Uh, on, on this particular segment, for the, the points to be considered because there is a non clarity in the announcement on unlimited liability partnership. Example, professional firms in UAE, which normally we all know these are legal persons, would be subject to corporate taxes, but there is a terminology which used that unlimited liability partnerships. Uh, tax treatment, you know, there are some gray area on that, but we would be able to clarify those once the regulations are announced. And exempt persons are federal and emirate level governments, wholly owned or UAE company, wholly owned, uh, government owned UAE companies that carry out sovereign or mandated activity. Business engaged in extraction and exploitation of UAE natural resources that are subject to emirate level taxation, charity and other public benefit organizations listed as per the cabinet decision by the FTA and public and regulated private uh, social security and, and retirement fund pension funds and investment funds subject to meeting the conditions. So the investment funds which are subject to meeting the conditions would be exempt from this corporate taxes. So in the coming slide we we'll discuss about what are the conditions for getting an exemption on investment funds. See th these are the conditions announced on, on getting uh, exemptions. First, regulated by a, a regulatory authority in the UAE, which is recognized by the ministry. No group of five or fewer investors has a 50% or greater economic interest in the investment fund. No single investor has a 20% or greater economic interest in the investment fund. Interest in the investment fund can be freely traded on a stock exchange in the UAE or are widely marketed and made available to the intended categories of investors. So through this, uh, what my understanding is, uh, the, the, the authority would like to say that the investment funds are, you know, basically investment fund managed through a regulatory authority in UAE would be taxed in the hands of the investment fund owners, not with the investment company. For getting the exemption for this, you know, the, these conditions should be uh, complied. Move on. Yeah, now I will focus on residential uh, status. You know, taxability based on residence. Now, the residential status mostly comprises of resi either resident or non-residents. First, we will focus on residence. 
residents of UAE, taxability would be natural person would be subject to corporate taxes on income earned from business in the UAE, which is already uh, discussed. Natural person who conduct activity in, 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 in UAE, who is supposed to generate such income through a commercial license should be taxed. And a legal person would be taxed, of course, no doubt, worldwide income subject to exemption from corporate taxes. Legal person in UAE would be subject to corporate taxes on the whole worldwide income. But you know, there are certain conditions associated with charging the, 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 the on the profitability uh, inter at international level. You know, so like mostly it's on tax credit basis. So we will discuss our my co panelist will discuss about the conditions associated. And residents again the same thing in a different form. Natural person, business or commercial activity, yes, will be counted as a resident for the tax purpose. Legal person incorporated in UAE, yes, again resident. Foreign company effectively controlled and managed in UAE is also counted as a resident company for the tax purpose in UAE. And non-residents. Non-residents, we know they are not residents, so the taxability purely depends on two scenarios. One is, are they earning any UAE sourced income? Number one. Number two, are they have an income from or taxable income from permanent establishment in UAE? Yeah, that is a question. So, UAE, if there is a UAE sourced income, yes, subject to taxes. And if the person has a permanent establishment in UAE, yes, again, that is also going to be taxed. If those conditions are not been meeting, then then they are exempt. So the the clarification, uh, the the consultation document, public consultation document, very specifically defined what what is the meaning of a UAE sourced income. Simple, uh, you know, uh, income earned from UAE resident person. Income is derived from activities or contracts performed in the UAE. Income is derived from assets located in UAE. Income is derived from rights used for economic purpose in UAE. If the payment is attributable to a PE in the UAE of a foreign company, UAE corporate tax regime will have specific rules and regulations or guidances to determine whether income has a source in the UAE or not. So through this uh, document, ministry wanted to say that UAE sourced income, you know, by a non-resident would be subject to taxes. Activity threshold. That will trigger a per see now we will focus on what is permanent establishment because in many of the slides of these uh, regulations or the, the public consultation document which talks about PE. So we, we have to make sure what is PE and, and what are the conditions associated to, to qualify a company or an individual or, or an entity to be a PE in UAE. Uh, there are two broad tests. Yeah, the, the, they have given the suggestion like uh, either test one, test two, you know, test the, the, the entity. So this is called fixed place of business test. Inclusions and exclusions are clearly mentioned. You know, basically it, it, it uh, like the regulation wanted to talk about if you have a place of fixed place of business in UAE through a place of management or through a brand or an office or a factory workshop, etc. Or, 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 or through a real estate property or a temporary office site or a building site, etc. would be counted as a fixed place of business and or eventually that will be counted as a PE in, in, in UAE. So normally we have seen temporary work sites. You know, temporary work sites, they put a condition that building sites where activities are carried out for over six months. That is only building sites. So any person who contacts business in UAE from a you know temporary place, like including residents, would be subject would be counted as a permanent establishment. Those, you know, residents would be counted as a permanent establishment for the corporate tax purpose. And exclusions are, you know, when those or uh, when this unit is used only to store, display or deliver the foreign companies goods or keeping a stock of goods with the sole purpose of making them available to another person for processing. So that is not for those category of the, the, the transactions or the, the entities would not be counted for the PE and eventually they will be out of the scope. And the second test is dependent agent test. Uh, a person who acts on behalf of a foreign company in UAE and habitually exercise the authority to conclude contracts in the name of the foreign company. You know, they have discretionary power or habitually exercise the authority to conclude contracts in the name of the foreign company. That is the condition uh, they have announced. Inclusions are where a person negotiates or includes contracts in the UAE on behalf of the foreign company without material intervention from the non-resident company. And, and, and there are some exclusions. You know, it says that person carry on the foreign company's business in the UAE in the ordinary course of their own business 
or person does not carry exclusively for the foreign company and is truly legally and economically independent from the foreign company. These are technical uh, you know, conditions associated to, to test a company or an entity that whether you are an independent agent or not. If we conclude that these are dependent agents, yes, automatically this will be counted as a PE. And there is another paragraph which uh, mentioned the similar concept of investment fund management, which I discussed earlier, investment manager exemption. You know, but these are, these are again, you know, the, an extension of what I discussed earlier. When a, a, an investment manager uh, conduct, provide or conduct a discretionary investment management service to foreign customers without triggering a UAE PE for the foreign investor or the foreign investment fund. The exemption will be subject to conditions that are comparable to similar regimes in leading financial centers. So an investment manager conducts activity on behalf of a third party would be, you know, subject uh, would not be counted as a PE, you know, with some conditions associated. Now, moving on, who will be subject to UAE corporate taxes? That is a question. See this chart, you know, this chart Describe it's it's a simple uh, presentation of what is announced through this uh, consultation document. You know whether an individual or a non-individual, meaning natural person or legal person. If it's a natural person, it's pointing to whether you are a, you know, permanent whether this individual or this natural person has a PE in UAE or not. If there is a PE, yes. Again, the sub question comes like, are you sourcing the income from UAE or not? If it is yes, subject to taxes. Other cases, no. So this is already explained. So in simple, an individual or a natural person conducts business in UAE, uh, you know, with a PE would be subject to corporate taxes. And, and again, it says that even if without PE, if he conducts a business activity, yes, this is going to be taxable. Other cases, no, but for the legal person, it's simply mentioned whether you conduct, whether, whether you conduct a, a business activity and are you falling under the below exempted category or not. You know, like earlier I mentioned, government entity, all your government entities, charity, uh, regulated investment fund. If no, all other legal persons are going to be subject to corporate taxes. That is what this diagram is about. Now, what are the exempt incomes? What incomes would be or, or what are the incomes which are going to be counted as exempt? Dividend. Yeah, all local dividends are exempt. Capital gains are exempt, you know, subject to certain conditions, which I will clarify. Foreign branch exemption, the profit from foreign branches are also exempt. Again, all these are subject to certain conditions. Other exempt income. I will focus on one by one. Yeah, if you talk about dividend, domestic dividend, yes, it is exempt. No doubt. Now the dividend from free zone taxed at zero percentage corporate tax rate is also exempt. So domestic dividend and dividend from a free zone, which is subject to 0% tax rate, both are going to be exempt. Now the dividend from foreign company is subject to be, uh, is would be dividend from a foreign company is going to be exempt upon certain conditions. Conditions are listed, 5% minimum shareholding. The shareholder should own at least 5% of the shares of the company. And foreign subsidy is subject to corporate taxes at a rate of at least 9%. Capital gains from sale of shares. I think the similar concept capital gains from sale of shares are exempt. Please note all other capital gains would be subject to corporate taxes with the available uh, you know, documents published by the ministry. So for getting an exemption on capital gains from the sale of shares, yes, these conditions should be fulfilled. Again, the same conditions, 5% of the shares, and this would be the foreign subsidiary is subject to corporate taxes, at least with 9%. Now, foreign branch, the next exemption category, foreign branch, when we have a company ABC LLC in Dubai or in UAE and XYZ Limited UK, yeah, that is a branch of a UAE company. Now, the, 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 the consultation document very specifically mentioned that ABC LLC will have two options, either claim the, the foreign tax credit for taxes paid in the foreign branch country or elect to claim an exemption for the foreign branch profits. In either way, these are not going to be taxed in UAE. Other exempt income that is, you know, a, a topic is given for non-resident who is operating or leasing aircraft or ships. 
used in international transportation, provided the same tax treatment is granted to a UAE business in the relevant foreign jurisdiction under the reciprocity principle. This is also counted as exempt income. Now, yeah, that's, that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jay Krishnan, for that uh, wonderful and well explained details on many fundamentals of our corporate tax. So before we move on to all our dear attendees out there, we will have a Q&A session at the end and the Q&A chat box has already been opened for you. So feel free to put us across any of the questions or queries that you have and we'll be taking it at the end. Uh, next, we will have the discussion on the topic of free zones and how our corporate tax and based on the new consultation document that has been issued. How does the how does it impact on free zones? And we have Mr. Nitin and K guiding us through the topic. Over to you, Mr. Nitin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to discuss about the corporate taxation in free zones. Uh, the points we are discussing is uh, based on the uh, public consultation document released by FTA, and these may change once the tax regulation is published. So uh, free zones are an integral part of UAE economy in encouraging foreign direct, foreign direct investment and enhancing the ease of doing business. There are more than 40 multidisciplinary free zones in UAE with the benefits of 100% ownership, 100% repatriation of capital and profits, exemption from corporate taxes and customs duties, etc. So under the corporate tax regime, uh, tax incentives will continue to be applicable for free zone entities provided they maintain adequate substance and comply with the regulatory requirements. So as per the public consultation document, free zone entities are within the scope of UAE corporate tax and are subject to tax return filing requirements and are expected to be treated as subject to 0% corporate tax. A free zone entity can make an election to become subject to regular corporate tax in UAE and such election is irrevocable. So now coming to the uh, uh, transactions which are applicable uh, at 0% uh, zero rated corporate tax. Uh, so we have listed out the um, transactions which are, uh, which are subject to 0% tax. That is the first one is income from transactions with businesses located outside UAE. So this is uh, any income earned from transactions uh, if we are with, with a foreign entity outside UAE, that is uh, at zero percent rate. Then trading income within the same or any other free zone. Uh, please note that it is trading income. So any income generated from a trading activity within the same free zone or, uh, or any other free zone is uh, zero percent. And income from regulated uh, financial services directed at foreign foreign markets. So there might be a, um, a details uh, detailed breakup given once the regulation is out. Then uh, the next is passive income from a mainland. Uh, passive income from mainland transactions. So passive income means interest, royalty, dividend, capital gains. Uh, so any income from uh, from mainland which is which is in the nature passive can be uh, is, is taxed at zero percentage. In transaction between the group companies located in the mainland. So any income generated out of it will be at zero percent. OK, yeah, so this slide uh, basically we are listing out the transactions where uh, the free, uh, income is taxed at nine percentage. So the activities regarding the services uh, income from services. So in the previous slide we discussed about trading activity, which is taxed at zero percentage. But uh, for any income generated from a service will be taxed at 9 percentage. Uh, uh, so that's the difference from uh, trading and service. And the second is the free zone entity which is having a mainland branch. So any income generated by this branch will be taxed 9 percentage. Uh, so the uh, the guidelines for over relocation will be a part of the uh, final regulation. So we will have to see how it works. Then any other mainland source will be part of uh, will be taxed at 9 percentage. So uh, summarizing the taxability of free zones in general, income from service transactions will be subject to 9%, whatever the free zone companies are running from service related transactions. Uh, income from uh, transactions between a free zone company and a com branch in a company outside UAE, uh, if uh, with a company in UAE, if any, if any income is earned out from outside the UAE or a foreign source income, then it will also be subject to 0%. And income from trading transactions between free zones, that also will be subject to 0% tax.
Now, taxability of free zone branches in mainland. Uh, branch of a free zone that is in mainland, a free zone entity in uh, any of the free zones and uh, their branches in mainland. And if any income is related to the activity carried on by the branch, then that will be subject to 9%. There will be no exemption for that. Uh, taxability of the passive income. Now, passive income, uh, it means not generated from any routine commercial trading business activities. It is like uh, reaping the benefits of our investments. Whatever income we get from that, that is termed as passive income. So, for example, interest and royalties, we might have some copyrights or something, or we have, we have, we have some deposits, we have given some loans, the interest and royalties from the copyrights, patents, the dividends from the shareholdings, the capital gains from owning the shares, in any of the mainland companies. So if any such activity is cons uh, done by a free zone company, all such passive income will be considered as zero rated. No tax will be applied. No corporate tax. Will, it will not be subject to any corporate tax. It will be subject to zero rate. Taxability of group company transactions. Now group company. Uh, now in UAE, the structure is gen in general. Uh, you can find many companies are group companies, closely related companies and all. So if free zone companies and group companies if and any if that reason company is having any group company in the mainland, then the transactions between that companies will be subject to 0% tax. Now taxability of uh, free zones. That is designated zones, uh, you know, uh, from that perspective, the free zone is having an extended definition called designated zones. Uh, all free zones are not designated zones in UAE. So the list of designated zone has been uh, clarified by uh, published by the federal tax authority. It is regulated by them. So a free zone entity which is located in any of the listed designated zones. And if they have a company which is in, in mainland then the income from sale of goods between those companies and if that mainland company is the importer on record. Those are familiar with the customs. They might be knowing that the importer on record must be the mainland companies then such transaction happening between the free zone company and the mainland company, which is the importer on record, will be subject to 0% tax. So this uh, definition everyone has to keep in mind the difference between the free zone and designated zones, which is which everyone is almost familiar from the VAT law. Now taxability of mainland source income. A free zone entity, if any income source from mainland from uh, by carrying out any business activity or any transactions with a mainland company. And if income source from such, uh, if uh, income is earned from such a mainland business activity, then that will be subject to 9% tax. So this was the summary of the transactions, which Nathan explained earlier, uh, that what all free zone transactions are, will be subject to 9% tax and will be subject to 0% tax. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Girish and Nitin for guiding us through the uh, free zones and apologies to the attendees for the technical glitches that we had faced. Moving on, we have an interesting topic that is the topic of transfer pricing and accompanying us explaining the topic. We have the expert that is uh, from our HLB Qatar. We have Dr. Antonio joining us. Over to you, Mr. Antonio. Uh, Mr. Antonio, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah, good afternoon, yes. uh, everyone. So I have a dedicated time. It's a uh, it's a very tough topic, so I will go. I will not go in very much details. I will just explain uh, in brief what is the transfer pricing uh, in Qatar and what is the applicability in the transfer pricing in, in Qatar, the method that had been used. So first, before we go into these details, it's uh, just I want to uh, to explain the concept of the transfer pricing. So the transfer pricing, it, it is commonly referred as the prices that are charged by individual entities, associated enterprises for any selling or buying materials between each other, between the subsidiaries uh, that are supplied or provided to one another within the multinational enterprises. This we call them the intercompany uh, transactions. The main principle of the transfer pricing that the, the, the transaction, they have to be at arm's length at arm's length as if you are dealing with any third party. So uh, the parent company is selling to another uh, third party entity. Uh, this is the principle that is uh, internationally accepted, acceptable all over the world. What are the challenges that we may face as uh, uh, the entities may face for the transfer pricing? The main challenge is how you're going to set the prices, how individual entities that are setting the price, how the group is setting the, the prices. What is the method that uh, uh, the group and even the, the, the entity or the subsidiary they are using 
uh, to be able to compare uh, whether uh, whether those prices are, are have been have been done or have been set at arm's length or or not. The common transactions of inter of transfer pricing are uh, the head office management fee, uh, accounting uh, outsourced fee between the subsidiary to another subsidiary or between the head office to the subsidiary. HR outsourced between the parent company. We can see it's commonly used between uh, international companies when they set up companies in, in, in Dubai or uh, in UAE or in Qatar. They are uh, providing support. So all this uh, transaction, they fall under the transfer pricing uh, uh, requirement or uh, transactions. Buying and selling product uh, to each other, uh, royalties, other services such as loans or uh, any company that is borrowing from another subsidiary, what is the interest rate they are using? They are charging. Are they are charging based on the market rate? Are they charging higher or charging lower? So this is all. It has to be clarified when we prepare the transfer pricing uh, uh, documents. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. So in Qatar, uh, uh, this transfer pricing law it has been introduced in in 2019, and when they issued the executive regulation. So the executive regulation is very detailed and it gives more uh, further. Uh, they gave also a further clarification about the transfer pricing in February 2021. Uh, in UAE, it is still, as they mentioned, my colleagues now, it's still under consultation as a public consultation documents. However, this, the substance is the substance. The, the, the content of the transfer pricing all over the world is the same because we're going to use the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Guideline, which is the OCD guideline. So it is almost the same, whether here or there. However, the only difference which will be is the threshold that uh, is applicable in every jurisdiction in Qatar, in UAE, or any other uh, jurisdiction. The first reporting uh, uh, period for it was in Qatar in April 2021. Uh, this is uh, for the transfer pricing disclosure form. We will talk later in the next slide uh, about the transfer pricing disclosure form and about the local and master file, which will be uh, uh, subject to filing in, in 30 of, uh, of June, uh, uh, not in April at, uh, in April of every year, because the transfer price and disclosure form is required to be submitted uh, along with the audited financial statement and uh, the uh, tax dis disclosure. However, the local and master file, there is a deadline for uh, another for 60 days from the uh, for the from April to June. Uh, the CBC, the country by country reporting, also is uh, applicable for any consolidated revenue for multinational uh, group, which is more than three billions. This will be required to be submitted by the 31st of uh, December. Also, the CBC reporting and the multinational group threshold three billion is also applicable worldwide based on the OCD uh, guideline. And there are specific transfer pricing rules and documentation requirements uh, in place. The transfer pricing disclosure form consists of information relating to the taxpayer uh, related parties transactions, including the method applied to ascertain the, ar the, the arms next uh, nature. So we have three. Uh, uh, we, we have the transfer pricing disclosure form and we have the local and master file and we have the uh, CBC uh, uh, reporting and the taxpayer should also prepare and maintain proper supporting documents for the transfer pricing uh, documentation between the transaction or between the material controlled transactions uh, 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 related parties. Why globally, as we, as we can see that all over the world, the number of uh, uh, worldwide trade transactions have been increasing, and especially the international and the global transaction, trade transaction between the intercompanies transaction have been increasing. That's why the tax authorities, they are focusing and giving more attention on, on this subject and are uh, transferring uh, uh, the transfer pricing requirements from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction. It was in Qatar in 2020. Now it is uh, they will they will apply it in UAE. So it's becoming uh, a, a substance. So the, for that reason, we have to be ready and we have to be uh, uh, prepared for any transfer uh, for the transfer pricing requirement by every uh, jurisdiction. And the most important for the transfer pricing is to be at arm's length. Uh, this is the uh, the 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 most uh, important. It is in what you have to do. It's okay. No, no, move. You can. It's better because we have a dedicated time and we. So what we have to do? What what you are, what you want to do now? You have to be ready. You need to prepare yourself. So to be ready for once uh, in UAE they uh, they issue or they for now they disclose they uh, uh, publish the uh, the law the executive regulation. You need to identify to just start preparing 
identify the related party transactions in your accounting books. Uh, you need to assess the transfer pricing method, uh, which will be, which must be in line with the OCD guideline that has been uh, amended in January 2022. It was the first one. It was in 2017. Then they have amended in January 2022. Uh, is it applicable to your company? Uh, so you have to be ready. You have to prepare uh, all the transactions, all the related transactions. You have to identify them. You have to see all the material control transactions in your uh, in your accounting books between the related parties, between even the branch, uh, the, per the permanent establishment and the parent company, uh, uh, between all these uh, transactions. Uh, you need to prepare. Uh, you need also to prepare, but depending on the threshold, we will talk in the next slides about uh, the threshold that uh, that you need to uh, to be ready about. In Qatar, the threshold had been set uh, for for let's for Qatar Real uh, uh, 10 million and above till 50 million. You need to to do only to present the tax uh, disclosure form, tax uh, uh, disclosure uh, form. Uh, tax, transfer pricing, sorry, transfer pricing disclosure form. The transfer pricing disclosure form is not detailed as the local file. However, from 50 million threshold and above, it, it is much more detailed. And we'll talk about it in the uh, next slides. What are the type of intercompany transaction? Transaction can be between the parent and its subsidiaries. It can be between subsidiaries and parent. It can be between subsidiaries and subsidiaries. And it came between subsidiaries and related parties. Related parties will not talk about it, about the definition. It's uh, based like similar to what is introduced in IAS International Accounting Standard 24. The definition of related parties uh, it, it has it applies to OCD guidelines. What are the methods that uh, have been introduced by OCD guideline and uh, being applied uh, in Qatar and definitely will be uh, applicable also in uh, UAE. You have the COP method, the comparable and controlled prices. You have the resale price method, the cost plus method, the profit split method, and the transactional net margin method. Uh, comparable and control. If you can go just the comparable and controllable uh, and controlled prices, we can. We have to split them into two. You have the internal COP and the external COP. So if you want to compare and to do the analysis, uh, the benchmarking uh, uh, analysis for, for the transaction, the internal CUP as if you are selling, a parent company is selling to one of its related party and the related party is selling to a third party. So we need to take the price of the third party to be able to compare it. The external CUP as if the parent is selling directly to a third party. So we need to take the, uh, the, uh, the, the price of the external party and compare it. So this is, the acceptable method in Qatar in the General Tax Authority. If you want to apply any other method, we need to get the approval from the GTA to be able to apply it. Uh, the entities with related parties transactions that having a total assets or a total revenue of over Qatar real 10 million threshold are required to file only transfer pricing disclosure form. Uh, this is starting from January 2020 on the Riva portal. And this uh, transfer pricing disclosure form, it will be submitted automatically with the audited financial statement in the system and the, in, in the system itself. Uh, there is there are some forms that you need to fill out. Uh, we'll talk about it later and then we will submit it uh, to the government. So uh, the Qatar resident entity with domestic or international related party transactions. Uh, the, trans the transfer pricing disclosure form requires from the entities to include any local transaction with related parties and any domestic, any uh, cross-border transactions. Uh, so any, if you have any related parties within the same jurisdiction, you need to also disclose about it here, about the transfer pricing disclosure form, and not only the cross-border transactions. This will be filed uh, with the income tax return, and it has to be submitted also 30 of April. What uh, what are the general information that you need to add or you need to incorporate in the in the in the Dariba uh, system? What is the main activity of the company? Uh, confirmation from from uh, from the management the management whether they have changed the business strategy or whether they are, if they don't have any strategy or any business strategy, whether if they are following any the group policy, the group strategy, uh, any changes in the business activities, any in the, uh, intangible use or owned by the reporting entity. The reporting entity is uh, it will be Qatar. The related party transactions, you need to explain and to give uh, further information about the nature of transactions. What is the nature of transaction? The nature of transaction is only uh, uh, they are supporting them. 
uh, there is no impact on the PNL. What is the impact? What is the interest? And so the nature of the nature of transaction is very important to explain and to understand because this will give uh, more information to uh, the management and even to the tax pricing uh, uh, track, uh, transfer pricing audit uh, when when they want to do audit by the tax authorities. The role of the reporting entity, the currency, transaction amount, the residence of the related party, and the transfer pricing method that has been used by the reporting entity. The local file. So let's this step here. So we were talking about the transfer pricing disclosure form, which is much much more easier, very simple. Any company below 10 million doesn't have to do anything. The threshold is 10 million and above till 50 million. So below 10 million, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to disclose. We can say we have a related party, but the turnover or total assets, both of them, it's not one of them. So one of them, it has to be met. Uh, and then uh, we will, if it is less than 10 million, we don't need to do anything. If it is from 10 million to uh, 50 million, we need to do the transfer price and disclosure for now. 10, 50 million and above, we need to go into much more detail, which is the local file. The local file is much more detailed than the uh, transfer price and disclosure form. Uh, uh, it has to, it includes only the cross-border transaction. It's uh, different from the uh, from 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 the transfer price and disclosure form that includes both uh, domestic transactions and uh, and cross-border transactions. Uh, and the local file, it cannot be prepared in Qatar and the same local file being used and exchanged uh, in, in UAE. No, every entity, every reporting entity, they have the, they have to prepare their own local file in every jurisdiction and they have to be to uh, uh, to submit it uh, to the to the government. The submission date here in Qatar is the 30th of June. If you can see the difference between the transfer pricing disclosure form, which is 30th of April, the uh, the local file is 30, 30 of June. What do you need to include? So based on the OCD guideline, chapter five, uh, you need to give more details about the, the management structure, the business strategy pursued by the local entity. And if the local entity doesn't have a business strategy, what is the business strategy that has been used by, by the group level? Uh, the local organization tries chart a description of individual uh, to whom the management is reporting and their country of offices. Control the transactions. Here we have to differentiate between the controlled and uncontrolled uh, transaction. The control transactions is any material control the transactions that is under the control of the management. The management is controlling those transactions. It's not selling directly to the third party. No, it is selling to the uh, related party. So any material, any description of uh, a description of the material control transaction, uh, procurement uh, of goods, purchasing of goods, uh, uh, selling product, uh, selling services, borrowing. So all these uh, 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 transactions, material transactions have we have to be described uh, by, by the management. And then we have the functional analysis, analysis to be able to benchmark uh, and to assess. Uh, we need to assess, we need to see uh, what is the, uh, how it is working. Uh, let's say uh, we have a, a, a three, four benchmark. Uh, how uh, it, from, it's like a supply chain, uh, how you are buying, uh, what are you doing here? It's, it, it's, is, it, is the company only distributing or they are producing? So the functional analysis is very detailed uh, uh, we will not go about about it now because it's it's uh, very detailed. Financial information you need to give uh, information about uh, the company, the intercompany transaction. What is what are the financial information, the financial statement, any financial performance of the company, and disclosure of bilateral uh, uh, the APAs and ruling the adverse uh, pricing uh, agreement. So any agreement, any material agreement between the related parties or between uh, the, the subsidiaries and the parent, they have to be uh, also disclosed. And we have to do the economic analysis. Search for comparable companies needs to be uh, refreshed. So how to do the comparable companies? You need to do benchmark. If you cannot use the COP method, uh, uh, internal or external, you know you need to go to any. Uh, there are several softwares all over the world that you can use, like Thompson, to be able to benchmark. If you need to benchmark the price, you need to use the TNMM method to, to check what is the price that has been used by this similar uh, company. They are selling the identical product. If it is not identical, at least it should be uh, the functionality of the product. It has to be similar and then you can compare those prices and then you will see whether the company is uh, aligning, uh, uh, is selling or uh, at arm's length. If they are selling at arm's length, that's that means within the, the, uh, the quartile. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. This is uh, this is a poor pricing.
So. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Antonio, for guiding us through this concept of transfer pricing. It is a pretty large topic to be covered. Also, what we heard right now was an overview of how this has been practiced in Qatar. So regarding the transfer pricing regulations to be practiced in UAE, it is yet to be issued by the ministry. So when they issue it, we'll also get to know more details, everything including the threshold. So thank you, Mr. Antonio. And moving on next, we will be discussing on the uh, on some other fundamental topics regarding corporate tax, such as losses and tax groups. And for that, I call upon Mr. Girish to take us through the topic. Over thank to you, Mr. Girish. Thanks, Vishma. Yeah, so now moving on to a very important and an interesting topic. Now people are very much, uh, what to say, they are, uh, they are now waiting for the corporate tax to come in, wherein the tax will be on the profits. So people will generally have a question, and this topic will be interesting. Most of the finance managers, okay, tax will be there on profit. What about the losses? How are you going to set up the loss, and what are the conditions? So as per the public consultation document issued by the Ministry of Finance, the tax losses can be carried forward 100%. Now, there are two different terms that needs to be understood, carry forward and offset. Carry forward, 100% of the tax losses in one year will be carried forward indefinitely to any period. However, the set off can be availed only for the 75% of the loss against the taxable income. Illustration will be a small illustration will be given in the further slide. To have the tax loss, to take the benefit of this tax loss, to set off this tax loss against any future future taxable profit, there are two conditions which is specified. One is the shareholders should hold at least 50% of the share capital at the time when the loss is incurred and at the time when the loss is carried forward. The shareholding, 50% of the shareholding should be intact. It should be the same. So once again, the 50% of the shareholding at the beginning of the period when the loss was incurred, the it must be the share, the 50% shareholding must be same at the time the loss has been carried forward. Now there can be cases where it's not, uh, you know, uh, these conditions are not applicable. That is when the companies are listed in a stock exchange. So if the companies are listed in any uh, ADX or Abu Dhabi stock exchange or any other stock exchanges in UAE, then you uh, that companies will have to uh, they don't have to fulfill the above following conditions to carry forward the uh, losses they don't have they don't have to min, uh, satisfy the conditions mentioned above now the illustration as said earlier the carry forward and the off loss uh, set uh, offset the carry forward loss is 200000 which can be carried forward from one year to the next year however the set off will be allowed only for the 75%. So 200,000, 75% is 150,000. The balance 50,000 loss can again be carried forward to be adjusted against the future taxable profits. Now, the, uh, the public consultation document has, has also stated scenarios where there will be no tax loss relief will be available. So no losses, the, so the losses incurred before the effective date of corporate tax will not be allowed for set off. Before the person who is claiming the set off is eligible, he becomes a taxpayer under the CT regulations, which is yet to be published. The losses income from uh, losses incurred from activities that uh, are assets which generate income that is exempt from uh, corporate tax. So if any uh, income, uh, for, uh, so if any uh, what to say, income is generated from any uh, category which is subject which is an exempt category, then any loss related to that will not be subject to be set off. And losses incurred by a free zone person that are not attributable to a PE in the mainland. These all uh, tax losses will not be uh, allowed to be uh, carried forward or set off. Now, point of consideration, one of the regular questions when internally we were having discussion with the tax committee and other consultants is that offsetting of losses of a free zone entity having 0% and 9% tax rates. A free zone entity can, uh, can have income subject to 9% and subject to 0% and also the Free zone can have losses. So how to attribute the loss to 0% and 9%? How to segregate uh, a particular loss to the 0% income category, 9% income category? That we will have to wait for the regulations to be published on the basis of the visa uh, bifurcation can be done. Now tax group. Uh, for VAT purposes, everyone is aware what is VAT grouping. Corporate tax, 
public consultation document and rules also we are expecting that the uh, tax grouping provisions will be allowed which is of course optional it is not mandatory it depends on the taxpayer's choice which all entities can be grouped which all entities i want to group and i don't want to group that is up to the to choice of the taxpayers but to do the tax grouping certain conditions have to be fulfilled one of the condition is if the parent company holds 95% of the share capital and the voting rights of the subsidiary so the parent company must hold at least 95% shares of the subsidiary company the subsidiary company must be using the same this all this all conditions must be satisfied it is not or it is and so all the three conditions must be must be satisfied so all the companies must be using the same financial year and neither the parent company who is holding and either the subsidiary company must be exempt person as explained by uh, mr jk earlier there are certain exempt category which is uh, which is uh, explained by the ministry of finance and the free zone persons though that get the benefit of 0% taxations so neither the parent or the subsidiary company which is going to be a part of the tax group should be having any exempt uh, income category should not be falling under exempt income category and should not be either a free zone person that is benefiting from 0% corporate tax rate now transfer of losses many of the group companies are uh, related the uh, from since after the vat implementation and now corporate tax now grouping has to be thought in three aspects one is the corporate group the company group the official company group then the vat group which we are registering and sure listed in the trn and another is going to be the corporate tax group so this group what they have explained is the group of companies the transfer of losses can be allowed the transfer of losses will be allowed among the group of companies among the group companies from the corporate group where they don't meet the 95% common ownership requirement as explained in the previous slide the parent company has to hold 95% uh, of the subsidiary to qualify for tax grouping in case they are not doing that in case they are not meeting the minimum requirement of 95% and for the companies who don't want to form a tax group a transfer of loss from between those companies is allowed is uh, regulated by will be regulated by the uh, federal tax authority the conditions are the uae group companies must be commonly owned by at least 75% common ownership must be there among those companies so once again the transfer of losses will be allowed if not between the tax group companies and not having 95% common ownership but they must be 75% commonly owned commonly owned and no tra loss transfers will be allowed from companies that are exempt that means the companies which are already exempt from corporate tax and not paying any taxes the losses incurred by those companies will not be allowed to be transferred and no loss transfers will be allowed from companies that benefit from zero corporate tax regime uh, for free zone free zone companies who are benefiting from the 0% tax so exempt companies and the losses earned by the free zone companies who are benefiting from the 0% tax the losses earned by them will not be allowed to be transferred to other profit making companies or other companies same here as explained earlier in the uh, losses category the losses can be carried forward indefinitely and 100% loss can be carried forward but the offset will be allowed only to the extent of 75% of the taxable income a simple illustration abc llc xyz llc and the common ownership that means abc llc is having a ownership of 75% of uh, xyz llc the transfer the losses can be transferred from a between abc and xyz or xyz to abc it can be transferred now intra group transfer of assets and liabilities now again a simple example abc llc and xyz llc which are commonly owned by 75% ownership there can be an asset transfer between the group companies which uh, when an asset is transferred or sold of course it will be subject to whether it is a loss or profit so it will be subject to tax however if it is happening between two related companies which are commonly owned that means again it is owned by uh, commonly owned by 75% and the asset that is transferred is within the same group for at least 3 years a lock in period is kept a 3 years then the intra group transfer of assets and liabilities will not be subject to any co uh, any corporate tax and if that three if any of the conditions mentioned above is not satisfied if any of the assets are transferred before the period of 3 years then the gain that would have happened at the time of initial transfer that will be calculated and that will be included in the transferers return restructuring relief similar scenario wherein restructuring or merger 
is happening where you are acquiring one company where i am selling one company or acquiring one company and a restructuring is happening there there can be gains and losses happening from that that also will not be considered provided the restructuring is intact for a period of 3 years if that condition is also not satisfied then it will be clawed back that means the lock in period if the lock in period is not met if any restructuring change is happening before the period of 3 years then it will be clawed back then then the same way the intra group asset transfer or asset and liability is happening the same way the profit will be calculated and it will be included in the uh, uh, tax payers return now treatment of unrealized gains and losses two categories capital items and revenue items capital items are uh, balance sheet items like machinery building and all and if unrealized lost unrealized loss of those capital items will not be considered for calculating the taxable income and for revenue items for example the books uh, the, the stocks in the books of accounts uh, that the unrealized profit or loss in that will be part of the taxable income so these are the two main categories which they have uh, which they have uh, uh, explained that capital items will be uh, will not be considered as a part of the taxable income or loss uh, calculation and revenue items also will, uh, revenue items uh, will be considered to arrive at the taxable income now uh, yes reshma thank you mr girish for uh, explaining to us in details on how losses and tax groups will be handled in corporate tax over to our next topic where we will be having a uh, further uh, explanation and discussion for regarding the computation and administrative aspects of how corporate tax is being impacted for that we have our audit partner uh, mr sumish over to you mr sumish uh, mr sumish you are on mute yeah good afternoon to you and thank you reshma so based on the my colleagues discussion this uh, side of the presentation also part of our understanding and our view points on the executive uh, proposal on the tax so this is one area where everybody is looking for what is the non deductible expenses probably considering the current ue environment we need to think about some accounting aspects also so these are the uh, areas which they have mentioned right now so related party payments made to a free zone person that is taxed zero percentage on receipt of the income will not be deductible of sct purposes so this is we assume that this is the perspective of the tax group so a company in the mainland which is a part of the tax group is giving a expense or purchases towards the free zone company then it will not be deductible for them okay then the second one is that expenditure incurred to entertain customers shareholders suppliers and other business partners are capped to 50% that means whatever you spend you can claim only 50% of that okay so 50% will be added to your taxable profit then apart from that administrative penalties recoverable vat and donations paid to an organization that is not approved charity and public benefit organization so this also will be added so here is the take away so whatever the non deductible expenses they mentioned you may need to correct your accounting system in a way that to capture this information which is readily available and which having an audit trail that is one side of that and the second one uh, we have a confusion on the customers shareholders and suppliers probably we assume that related to the staff facilitation expenses this might be a deductible expenses but the clarity needs to be brought into that then administrative penalties means usually you see that the uh, aspect specifically to the uae vat law there are many administrative penalties are there so whatever the penalties and fines you are paying related to the tax law or commercial law which will not be a deductible item like failure to register for vat failure to file vat returns or failure to pay tax there are lot of penalties are there so this penalties also you cannot deduct as the purpose of the corporate tax and the donations specifically they mentioned that donations so we know that many of our companies clients are giving lot of donations to different charity organizations here also there is a catch that in uae there are 
only 11 government entities are allowed to take donations and they listed another 24 charitable organizations and two human humanitarian associations. So you are able to give donations to this entities only to get a deduction from the government. Yeah. So interest capping rules. So here you can see that the uh, clarification is came net interest expense that can be deducted 30 percentage of a business earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. OK. And it is not applicable for the business carried out by a natural persons. So the legal persons are allowed to deduct maximum 30 percentage of the taxable profit as an interest. So this is basically we feel that it is followed through the OECD guidelines on uh, BEPS, especially to uh, prevent the profit shifting. So there is one more clarity needs to come here. Basically, whether this includes the legitimate interest which incurred by an organization from the banks and financial institutions. What we believe is that 30 percentage is cap which includes the related party funding transactions where the people are able to charge any any interest to reduce the profits. So 30 percentage is the current cap which the points of consideration is that legitimate interest such as interest or banks and financial institutions also included in this cap. And probably they they they, they are uh, considering a blanket approach for the group tax group companies because different companies have a different uh, standards subsidies have a different uh, type of interest uh, expenses some some may be capital uh, intensive loans are taken some may be the working capital loans. So, so the interest composition will be different so we are expecting that there would be a blanket approach also will come and especially yeah you can move to the next slide so in UE, there are many related party loans are playing into the business of the uh, entity. So that that is also need to be considered to see that one company is giving loan to the another company, and this should be applicable under the tra uh, transfer pricing mechanism going forward. So you cannot jack up any interest, if especially if the company, the other company is a free zone company which is paying zero percent tax. So transfer pricing also coming to the picture for the interest allowances. Then another point is that withholding tax. This is also totally new to the UAE business people. What is withholding tax? But generally it is uh, commonly uh, implemented in many other uh, GCC countries. So withholding tax mainly applicable to the income earned by a non-resident company from UAE. Income from UAE which is earned by a non-resident company. Usually it is uh, considered not on the profits of that particular transaction. It is considered on the payments of that transaction. So if a company paying to outside company on the services they are entered, so probably you need to deduct a percentage before you are paying. This is what the withholding tax mechanism is working. So this payment can be also not only in cash. This can be also kind also will be considered like you are offsetting some liabilities sort of things. So it differs from the ordinary corporate ta taxation. So in GCC generally the rates for withholding tax is coming 5 percentage to 15 percentage in different countries like Oman it is 10 percentage. I believe in Qatar it is 5 percentage and uh, KSA there is uh, different caps 5, 10, 15 caps for different type of transactions. So this is the scenario, but in UAE at present there is no. Uh, there is a zero percentage withholding tax, so that means you need to declare the transactions, but no need to pay any tax and in withholding some tax scenarios, there are many tax reliefs are given based on different conditions because if you are taking a project in the government, probably government can give you tax reliefs and other things. Then there is a scenario of withholding tax agent. Let's say an MNC company have a, a branch office or a 
uh, cost center in UAE. So there is a uh, withholding tax agency scenario will come and permanent establishments as we discussed that even there is uh, no uh, permanent establishment, but you will work with some facilities like you, you are supporting some construction, you are supporting some manufacturing, which you are facilitating your parent company's business here. So this also coming to the withholding tax scenario. So going forward, these transactions are separately tracked through your accounting system. What are the transactions you are making with a non-resident company which you are availing the services and you are paying for their services. So at present it is zero percentage, but the visibility on the transaction should be brought into your books of accounts. OK, next one is the tax credits. So as we discussed initially that a legal person's worldwide income. Is taxable in UAE if the company is registered in UAE. So. Here you, you can see that. There is a foreign tax credit. If you, you are paying some tax in another part of the world, you are able to deduct. But subject to the UE limit 9% which is lower. So the maximum foreign tax credit available will be lower of the amount of tax that paid in the foreign jurisdiction or the corporate tax payable on the foreign source income. So literally you are going to get 9% is the maximum cap. And on that also there is no carry forward of tax credits and no refund of unutilized credits. So that is only applicable to one year literally. Then going forward the administration part. So registration. Should be done uh, within the timeline what they mentioned. So you need to obtain a TRN and if you are not registered and the FT also came to understand that you should be registered, probably they will do a registration from their side. That's what the uh, proposal submit uh, mentioning. Then the deregistration also within three months after the date of the cessation of the entity. Then return filing period uh, and payment of tax within nine months at the end of the relevant tax period. Currently they are not emphasizing a unified accounting period. So who are followed different accounting periods, you will get a nine months after your financial year end. And according to them, they mentioned that there is only one tax uh, return per year and there is no need for a provisional tax return. So as an example, the financial year, you can see that if you follow 30th June as a financial year end, so the date of filing will come on 31st March 2025. So similarly, 31st December is your financial year accounting period coming. Then your first return needs to be filed on 30th September. Similarly, 31st March should go on 31st December. So there is a nine month gap which you are able to have to prepare your financial accounts, then file the tax return. And the documentation requirement, especially the taxable persons, you need to keep the financial and other records combined in CT returns and other documents submitted to FTA. So you, you've seen that whatever we discussed on the overview of the tax, there are many accounting documents are involved. So this is one of the challenge. If you, you need to streamline your accounting system and uh, um, the record maintenance system. Then exempted persons also you need to maintain a record to ascertain to prove that you are an exempted person. So both cases you need to keep the full books of account with the relevant documents. Then audited financial statement free zone persons they mandatory mentioning that if you want to claim zero percentage corporate tax, you need to have a audited financial statements needs to be presented and the other persons at present they were not emphasized, but According to the existing regulations, let, let's say if you follow UAE federal law like LLC companies, it's already there, which you supposed to get uh, prepared the financial statement on the IFRS and get it audited. So this is already there. So we believe that it is covered in that. Yeah, Rish, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sumesh, for uh, guiding us through that wonderful time where we had uh, more profound knowledge on many basic and fundamental concepts, including documentation and other administrative works. So uh, on a concluding note, uh, how do we move forward? So for all 
entities, first what we need to do is to have an impact assessment on how corporate tax will be uh, applicable for each of us. What at what rate will we have to do? So we can do a transaction analysis. So basically, on how much corporate tax will be impacted for you and your entity, that will need to be assessed first. And it can be proceeded with further planning and designing, wherein we have to have a proper tax planning in place. We need to have sufficient resources for that, which includes software as well as employees. And also, yeah, sometimes even uh, we'll have to incorporate many changes, including a business structure change. So it needs to undergo a proper tax planning through which we can uh, undergo with a proper implementation and for the further years where corporate tax will be uh, established in UAE, it will have to be stabilized and it should be moved forward in such a way. So moving forward, we need to have a good tax planning in place. So which brings us to our wonderful conclusion for our webinar today. So uh, we will be immediately moving on to a Q&A session. So uh, as we mentioned before, the Q&A platform is already open for each of you. Feel free to pass us the questions and then we'll take it one by one as per the time permits. Um, so first. Uh, first, uh, uh, I would like to ask the question to Mr. Jay Krishnan. Uh, sponsorship fees paid to a local person in Dubai. How will that be impacted in corporate tax? What would be the implications? Yeah. Um, sponsorship fee, uh, legally speaking, sponsorship fee is counted as a, a profit share. Yeah, because sponsor is a partner in the license. As long as he's a partner in the license, whatever we pay to him would be counted as a you know profit share or as a dividend, which as of now, if you see the public consultation document, there is no, you know, announcement specifically, uh, you know, qualifying or disqualifying on, on paying dividend to the shareholders. But in my view, that would not be a deductible expense. If you want to be, uh, if you want us to make it as a deductible expenses, there should be a separate working agreement with the company from the sponsor that he's actively working. And if it is against a management fee or, or something like a remuneration from the company against the, 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 the work involved, yes, probably that would be a deductible expenses. But if not, simply a sponsorship fee would not be a deductible expenses. Instead, it would be counted as a uh, withdrawal of the profit share. That's what I feel. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. JK. Uh, over to Mr. Sumesh. Uh, increase or decrease in net profit due to change in accounting estimate or policy or due to a new IFRS. What is its impact if effect on taxable income and tax? OK, at present uh, this is also debatable, but they, they clarified that you no need to maintain two set of books of accounts for the income tax purpose and accounting purpose. So what you need to follow IFRS or any approved accounting standards so within the standard, what are the changes? We believe that th th that is allowable. OK, uh, thank you, Mr. Sumesh. JK, once more over to you. Yeah. Is income from reversal of accruals or provisions of previous years taxable or not? See, that is a, a tricky question. Reversal of provisions from the previous year. Normally, uh, see that, that would be part of a taxable income because that normally goes to the credit side of the uh, statement of income as, a, as an income part of the income. So the question is whether the bad debts or the, the, the expense are earlier disallowed allowed on, on such provisions. That is the only thing we need to make sure. Say, for example, in the previous year, we have claimed a bad debt provision. Yeah, and, and there was an eligible deduction of certain amount in the previous years. And, and that has been already allowed as an expenses in the previous year. When we reverse it back, in the next year or in the forthcoming periods that would be subject to taxes. Imagine another scenario that bad debts are disqualified due to various reasons as per the, the eligibility criteria or whatever. And any reversal from such you know, provisions would not be taxable because that is not allowed in the previous periods. That is a fundamental practice which globally everywhere follows. I, I think in UAE as well, uh, what we have seen in the VAT regulations are also like, you know, they would be putting a condition on, on the, the the 
qualification like the eligibility for claiming any 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 provision as an expenses once that is announced we can we can come to a conclusion that whether this is allowed or disallowed generally speaking reversal of a provision would be counted as a taxable income all right uh, thank you mr jk uh, next question to mr antonio uh, how is arms length method applied when companies only making transaction to related party or a subsidiary and does not make transaction to third party. Just where what it is this? No, it's it's a it's a question that we got from our audience. Uh, how can, is, can you repeat the question once again? Yes. Can you repeat the question, please? How is arm's length method applied when companies only making transaction to a related party or subsidiary? And does not make transaction with third party. Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, we need to check. Uh, we need to follow uh, the TLM method uh, uh, and uh, to do the comparability analysis with another with another company. Uh, 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 let's let's call it. Let's make it simple. A competitor. They are selling the same identical product, or if it is not identical, same. Uh, they are selling the same similar functionality of the product. And then uh, uh, we will take what is the return on sales or what is the net profit margin this company uh, uh, is uh, generating. We will compare it with uh, the company and you will see if it is more or less. If the company is charging, let's say the, the revenue is more, is the income of the company is more than the competitor or the uh, benchmark, the comparability company, that's no problem. If the profit generated is less, that means uh, there is an issue and they need to adjust. Uh, they need to adjust the difference in the tax. Yes, OK, so they need to apply the uh, the TNMM method. Okay? OK, thank you, Mr. Antonio. Uh, Mr. Jacob, a question regarding free zones. Income from sale of a free zone based company to mainland company. When such sales happen inside free zone, will it be zero or nine percent? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, for the sale of an item from free zone to another party, but that happens within the free trade zone, right? Yes. So that, that sale happens within the free trade zone, meaning so what does that mean? The, 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 the logically that the person who buy the material go and collect it like he will be using his own customs code or the TRN number to buy the material from a free zone. Yeah, there is a, a separate provision we have discussed and when, when Nitin was presenting on the slides that you know when so that would be uh, as per that sheet. If you go back to the sheet, you can see that that is zero percentage. That would be counted as zero percentage. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, over to Mr. Girish, a question to you. Can loss from period before tax enforcement be carried forward to offset against taxable income. Yeah, hi Rishma. Uh, no, we cannot offset that loss which has been uh, carried for uh, losses incurred before the enforcement date. We cannot carry forward that is they have specifically mentioned. Before the effective date, whatever the losses, we cannot carry that for set off. OK, uh, thank you, Mr. Girish. Next uh, to Mr. Sumish, is Sakat a deductible expense? Yeah, see, uh, Sakat might be a deductible expense, but there might be some conditions we are expecting because usually it is 2.5 percentage of the revenue, or probably they will uh, bring the uh, uh, non deductible expense. They explain that to the donations towards what? So we are expecting more clarity and at the moment we believe that Sakat can be a deductible expense. Yeah. OK, uh, thank you. And Mr. JK, uh, there is a question regarding what is a passive income? Can you please explain us in brief? Yeah. Once more? Yeah. Passive income, the term itself is clear. You know, these, these are not active income. Any income other than active income would be counted as passive income. Passive income mostly comprised of Say example, I would say you, you are a company who engaged in trading of a product. You buy and sell and make profit out of that. So what happens if you, you know, incidentally or as a part of the trading business and, uh, and that, that is your active business, but you are investing in, 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 in say other company in the mainland or abroad. 
or you earn some interest. You know, those non active transactions would be counted as passive incomes. So that is not your regular business. That is being an incidental to your main business. That is what the, the, the passive income meaning. So the, the, the structure which we discussed through that slides specifically mentioned that passive income. You know, I, I think that we have already clarified that in that slides. You no know, passive income would be, uh, you know, exempt. So that is what I have. I remember from the previous uh, session. So passive income meaning these are non active income, which is not counted as a regular course, which is generating not in the regular course of business. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. JK. Uh, so as we're uh, nearing 530 already, so we will wind up our Q&A session for now and any further Q&A that you had received, we'll be surely providing you a response very soon. Also, uh, like some uh, some of us who have requested this uh, webinar along with the link and the PPT will be shared very soon. So please to follow us through our social channels, especially LinkedIn, where we will be posting and sharing this webinar to you guys. So thank you to each and every attendee who have joined us today for this webinar and thank you to our esteemed presenters for the day. Uh, Mr. Antonio, Mr. Nitin, Mr. Sumesh, Mr. JK and Mr. Girish. So see you all for the next webinar very soon. Till then, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah.